Real quick, um, we're going to be talking about the container shipping industry. Clearly, there's a lot of interesting things happening in the container shipping industry. Um, we need to remember that, you know, despite all the problems that are being faced in the container shipping industry, ships are still being moved, cargo is still flowing. Um, but to that point, um, and I guess I'll start off with uh, Howard um, from Costco. Um, you know, Howard, I mean, clearly anybody that's in this room has probably read or at least heard about what's going on with Hanjin shipping. And, the, and, and, and really, I guess my first question is, you know, could you talk a little bit about what, you've, what you're seeing in terms of impact for the, uh, the container shipping markets with the recent announcement by Hanjin that it was going into uh, restructuring? Sure. Um, it's, it's, it's almost hard to discuss this right now because I'm dealing with the trees and it's hard to look at the forest because uh, not only is Costco a competitor of Hanjin, uh, we are currently in an, an alliance with them. Um, uh, CKYHE Alliance. So what's happening basically with us personally, and I'm involved with this, is we have uh, Hanjin vessels coming in with Costco containers that are difficult for shippers to pick up. And of course, uh, Hanjin containers on Costco vessels where uh, some ports are, we were, were kind of working this out, but it, at first per, ports were, um, uh, they didn't want to take the Hanjin boxes off of our vessels. Um, we've got most of that under control right now. Um, I think it's going to have a pretty huge effect on, on the market. Um, a couple of lines have already kind of stepped in, um, try to announce they're, they're going to have some new services. Um, everybody has fairly big ships today. So I don't think you're going to see a huge impact on supply and demand, but I think what's going to happen is the uh, if you're a shipper, and uh, Hanjin had it's around eight percent market share of the Trans Pacific. Um, there's a lot of cargo on their vessels that's being frustrated, and unless uh, the rates come up to a decent level, you may see other companies uh, fall to the same situation. And uh, I think that the market is realizing that uh, we cannot continue to operate like this. So I think it's a kind of a wake-up call. It's not going to have a huge impact on supply and demand, but uh, I think there will be some effect. And shippers are, are I think, going to get the message that uh, we cannot continue to operate at non-compensatory levels. I, I would ask, Greg, if I could just ask how it we're sensing that rates are up almost 50 percent short-term rates to you know to covering part of the hanging cargo um can that can that sustain beyond christmas do you think or they're going to drop off again um my personal opinion is they'll they'll go up a little there was a we just had a gri uh september 1st that was probably one of the first times we had a successful general rate increase there was another one scheduled for September 15th. That's not going to go through. There's another one October 1st, may go through. It's not going to go through as much. But however, you have to realize that everybody says they're up 50%. That's for the short-term market, the spot market mostly. Uh, the contracts, the long-term contracts we have with shippers, there's very few of those contracts we actually can get the GRI. So it will have an effect. The rates are going up, but there it's it's tempered by the BCL contracts compared to the spot market. Okay, great. And just, I mean, you mentioned um, some some of the other liner companies have have already announced uh, new services to offset the Hanjin, um, you know, lack of service. You know, I guess two M's really pounced on this immediately with instituting a new loop. When we see that happening, should we be thinking that these companies' existing services are fully utilized, or are they just that they just have there's that that much overcapacity in the system where even though utilization is low, they want to offer more service? It's a it's kind of a mixture of both. You know, it's kind of funny. Um, I don't want to say anything about my competitors, but some of the services that we offered uh, that are kind of unique. Um, that Hanjin was on the vessels with us. We offer a Prince Rupert service, which is a, 
a Canadian port that basically serves the Midwest of the United States, and we offer a Gulf call. Um, I think uh, two carriers are very well known have announced that they're going to have a Prince Rupert call. Um, that is a very popular uh, port right now. Uh, I think people, that's not a port where we're looking for cargo. There's, there's probably too much cargo. And what's going on in the Gulf right now is the uh, actually resin shipments are going to explode. So two areas where Costco was involved, actually Hanjin kind of rode on our back. And we, we were ones who started the Prince Rupert service and started the Houston service. Um, those are the areas I think that uh, people are really going to take a look at and try to go into. Um, of course, Costco, you know, being an alliance member, we didn't go out and announce right away, oh, we're going to put more vessels in. Uh, I think that would be not the right thing to do with, a, with an alliance partner, but of course we're looking at it. We're going to protect our, our markets in Prince Rupert and through the Gulf. And then Peter or, or Tassos, just as, as you know, as alliance, alliances have been changing more recently and, and there's been adjustments, have you noticed any changes in, in how you're dealing with your customers? Is, is there any opportunities that you're able to benefit from any of these shifting in alliances or is it more just business as usual? So I, I think at C-SPAN we've, um, you know, we, we've got some obviously some very strong relationships. Um, I think not surprisingly, like many, one was blindsided by Hanjin. Um, I think there was an expectation that KDB might step in, um, maybe run Hyundai and Hanjin together. I think a lot of press has been written. I think Alpha Liners was uh, astute and uh, acerbic at the same time. When they wrote about what could have happened or what perhaps should have happened and perhaps Hanjin was badly handled. I think there's a great sense now as a liner company, as a, an operator, an owner operator, um, to, it, it, that we're in a wait and see mode. Um, there is, as, as we all know, a lot of tonnage out there. Obviously there's no new buildings come, being ordered now in the big sizes. Uh, so I, I think we're seeing that in the customers we're talking to, about our sort of ships that could potentially come off Hanjin. There's an interest, but everybody wants to sort of wait and see how it plays out. If demand holds, if even the spot rates increase, because the spot rate increases actually will turn a number of liner companies, red lines into black lines by, by the end of the year. I mean, there's enough spot cargo that some of the, those who are unprofitable will be profitable. So to some extent, actually, our counterparty risk actually sort of is, decreases, you know, in the short, certainly in the immediate term. But it's very much a wait and see and see how this plays out. I think there's probably an expectation that Hanjin doesn't come out of this and doesn't reorganize. I think the, my money would be on that. Uh, I, I'm a feeder operator, so I can talk uh, uh, from that point of view. The um, realignment, I guess, and uh, re rearrangement of alliances, which will become even more uh, intensified uh, by the hands in developments, uh, creates a relatively um, un, un, not unstable but unclear environment for the, for the feeder operators uh, in the sense we don't really know who the, who the final client is because <laughs> really feeder operators feed off the main services that uh, uh, the big alliances uh, put in place. I mean, you have here recently news of CMA, for example, not doing outsourcing the feeder operators its feeder operations. So really there is a, a moving landscape uh, at the moment and we're also in sort of wait and see mode trying to uh, determine who, who is really the client, how we can uh, sort of line up our own services uh, to the industry. I, I think dislocation of any kind is probably good for the feeder market in, in the immediate term. That's uh, probably, that's probably right. true, I guess. I mean, Dislocation of any kind is good for the whole industry, especially yeah, if productivity like goes down, yeah. more ships are and, needed. And, and war. War is good too, right? <laughs> I mean, it's hard, hard to say that. But <laughs> and, and then just, uh, Peter, I mean, you, you mentioned a couple of your vessels. Just as, as we think about the impact that the Hanjin, and, and don't worry, we're not going to spend this whole time talking about Hanjin, um, but as, as we think about those vessels that are on, on, 
you know, with Hanjin right now. Is there any way to quantify the, the total size? I, I would think just since you're with them, you must have a sense for how many vessels we could actually see be put on the market. Uh, you know, as we think 63. about- 63. And, and in terms of capacity, you know- be Well, you know, I mean, it, it's sort of public how many ships Hanjin have. Sure. And I think if they, you know, if they don't reorganize successfully, and my money would be not on a reorganization, but ultimately on a liquidation, you will see effectively 95 ships, 31, something like that, maybe 93, whatever, 60 plus chartered and 30 plus owned coming back on the market. And, you know, if cargo is not growing, we're still, it's not fixing the supply problem. Um, some of the better ships will be taken up by some of the, you know, other operators. Um, but of the 60 chartered ships, there's that whole bracket in the sort of, we say the sort of the traditional cascade ships right now, the three to five thousands that may struggle to find employment in a in a market where, you know, if you look, for example, how many four thousand TU ships are unemployed, um, Hanjin actually, interestingly, w with the proponents of scrapping with the four thousand TU ships about a year ago, they I think they scrapped about fifteen of theirs, um, and so I think we will see more scrapping of, of the mid-sized ships. The older ones. Yeah. The older, well, not even, not so old, right? Yeah. Define old, right? Um, yeah. 15 plus, whatever. Yeah, 15 plus to 18. 18. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. we've certainly seen 97 scrap regularly. Yeah, um, Costco has an extremely you, aggressive you, scrap. Costco just ones, scrapped right? uh, right. five 3500s. That's right. And they were 01 builds, I think, That's right? right. Mm -hmm. They announced yes. last week, yeah. yeah. Hansen uh, operated 3%, I guess, of the of the whole fleet. So for the, for the short period in the immediate future, that that fleet probably will not be employed. So that's a good news in terms of the overall supply demand. But as Peter said, at some point, not in the too distant future, those ships will return to the market and it will not solve the supply problem uh, of the industry. <laughs> the owners, we have to solve it, I guess. Yeah. Well, we're not unlike dry bulk, right? I mean, if new building slows down um, and, and basically seems to stop, at least on the larger ships, that contracts supply on one side. And then if we can increase scrapping, which has happened, it, yeah, it's a little slower. Yeah, the only thing is that the scrap companies are mostly on the feeder sector and not on the right. you know, non-feeder container. Right, and area. in the bigger so ships, they're all much newer ships. I mean, the average indeed, age indeed, of the yeah. sort of 8,000 TU ships is probably no greater than five or yeah. six years. Sure, Abs absolutely. So, you know, just shifting gears, um, just because it's a little bit topical um, with, with the Panama Canal and, and TASAS, I'd be curious, you know, how you're thinking about the market just because, you know, when we think about the Panama Canal, there's talk of, you know, sort of hub and spoke type new services that could pop up. Is, is there anything that, 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 that the feeder industry should or be, is thinking about doing to maybe take advantage of what is happening with the Panama Canal? That's part of the environment that makes the picture for the feeder operators less clear. The alliances and the bigger liners uh, are rearranging their services, trying to see how they can optimize their routes with the presence of the, uh, of, the, of the new canal. At the same time, the old canal becomes more economical because rates, crossing rates, I think, uh, uh, are coming down. So there is a whole reoptimization of the industry. That's why I mentioned earlier that we are trying to figure out where the dust uh, uh, will, will, uh, will settle. Uh, I mean, a combination, I guess, of the, of the Hansen and the canal and the, uh, created some opportunities for us. I mean, we had uh, one of the ships that were the doomed ones between the 4,000 and the 8,000 ones. But, you know, uh, the, the fact that certain Hansen ships were out of the market uh, gave us some chartering opportunities for one of our ships that was in that range. So we are, again, figuring out uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a period of, I would, of redefinition, I guess, of the trade lanes uh, in the container, container ship sector. Yeah, I'd just like to add, because we're a big player in the Panama Canal. We actually had the, the first vessel go through there. Um, it kind of comes at a good time also, because as everybody knows, we're going through an integration with China Shipping and Costco. Um, and it, my part of the world, uh, strangely enough, Costco, as big as we are, um, we don't have a north-south service. 
and a lot of opportunities. The Panama Canal, everybody, you know, thinks at first, oh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change, it's going to be a real game changer, there's going to be a lot of cargo that's coming through the West Coast, it's going to go through the canal. I don't think the, uh, the major BCOs, with the delays that have happened, and truthfully, you can't have a major service uh, in the Panama Canal without New York being ready, and we all know the Bayonne Bridge is not ready. Um, but as I said, I think Costco is now, we have a lot of ships, we have China shipping services, there's some redundancy. We're going to be looking into new areas, we're going to be looking into north-south, we're talking uh, about different areas, poss possibly bringing feeder ships. So it's uh, one time, at one point it's a, it's, it's a frustrating time, but it's also kind of an exciting time in the industry. And especially north with south would be with sort of eight to tens primarily? Probably, yes. Pri yeah. 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 Which, is, which is a, you know, a result of the bigger canal and the bigger ships going through. Exactly, yeah. yes. And that's the main route, the, uh, the main trading route that the canal would have an impact, the north-south route as yeah, opposed to the right. yeah. east-west. Which puts more pressure continued on this sort of, the ones that you started scrapping and, you know, this three to 6,000 TEU band seems to be the most vulnerable cascaded band of ships generally. You, you know, it's, it's interesting because I, I feel like for the last two or three years people have been talking about that sort of medium-sized Panamax vessel or the 4,000 really hitting hitting a pressure point. And, and it's interesting because as you think about where you've seen a lot of ordering, you know, you've seen a lot of ordering for the larger vessels. You've seen a lot of ordering, not a lot, but some for the sub-Panamaxes. Is, is, is there an opportunity maybe that the Panamax market could be, you know, ha have one last golden age before it sort of becomes obsolete or... You know, I mean, I'm, I'm curious, Howard, if you see any opportunities for those vessels as you describe these changing trade routes with, with the addition of, of a north-south. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I could see, see it. I mean, we're faced with, as I said, uh, two combined companies now uh, with a lot of tonnage. Um, vessels in that size, there's, there's plenty of them there. Um, and we have untapped markets. And we have markets that are probably going to be direct served, some going to be feeder served. Um, so, yeah, I could see that being something that, uh, that could happen. Although I would argue it would be, it would be hard for the Panamaxes, the traditional Panamax, the 4,000s, to, to play a bigger role than they have already played. I mean, there was a lot of cascading of those ships into our feeder sector back in 2013 14. And I mean, if there was more cascading to, to take place, I can argue it would have taken place. I mean, there's always more that you can do at the margin, but I think they have, uh, to a great extent, exhausted their cascading uh, capacity down to the smaller sizes. I mean, I don't want to forget that the fact that you always try to use the bigger ship you can on a, on a route because you reduce the cost even on the feeder routes. But uh, I, I don't see as uh, great a picture for the, for, you know, for the medium uh, segment there from 4,000 from 4, to 6, 7,000. Um, w people will try to recharge the ships as, as long as they can, but there will be a point where the market, the economics of the market will not allow that. Yeah, I, you know, we've seen charter rates dip from, you know, when a lot of these ships were employed in, say, West Africa and the like, go from sort of 15,000 a day down to the Six. traditional, f yeah. f 6 is good. Five is four, four and a half to five is the going rate now, and I think there's a value in last man standing when everybody's finished scrapping their ships. Great. You know, I mean, there's got to be more scrapping to get, you know, real utilization up on these. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, I, you know what? I guess as as I look at the clock, um, you know, let's just talk a little bit about demand. I mean, clearly, shipping is a demand-driven industry. You know, it's it's. It's pretty easy to quantify what supply looks like, but, but demand seems like, you know, that, that's where the opportunity to, you know, to be a little bit different stands out. I mean, I mean Howard, just as, as, you know, as you think about what, what Costco is doing and what you're seeing in, in terms of, you know, trade flows, you know, any sort of thoughts or any high-level color you can provide around what you're seeing out of China? Um, well, we're certainly not going to see the growth that we've seen in the past out of China. Um, I still think China will be the major uh, driver of, of, of trade, but uh, you're not going to see the, the growth you've seen in the past. You're not going to see double-digit growth. You're going to see probably low 
single digit growth for the next couple of years. Um, but uh, I, I hesitate, you know, I've been in this business 35 years and every time I think, well, you know, we, we solved the supply and demand situation. It never gets solved. At the end of the day, that's really what drives things. However, I really feel this, uh, this situation with Hanjin is such a game changer. We've had companies go out of business before, um, but not to this extent. Um, and I think, and, and everybody always talks about supply and demand, and of course during the lull seasons, um, you know, there's a lot of space on vessels. But during peak seasons, depends on the year. Sometimes here, you know, the carriers are at full utilization. So a shipper who says, you know, uh, you know, supply and demand is not in your favor, I, I've, I've, I negotiate a lot of the terms, and I negotiate the terms in all our commercial contracts with shippers. Um, and I've seen a lot of them say, you know, supply and demand is not good, you know, it's not in your favor, we need this rate. But then they'll, they'll put things in the contract that say, oh, during peak season I want this, 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 and this. And if we, if we agree to this for everybody, they, there's not enough space. So during peak season that uh, supply is pretty much used up. And you have to realize that. And I think right now, um, supply and demand I don't see going in our favor. But I think the, just the realities of the market and what's happened will change things a little bit. It's not going to be overnight. I don't think we're going to you know, bring rates up to where we actually need to start making money for at least a year. But I think it's going in the right direction. But if you look at, you know, liner company profitability, it's, it's always been like this, you know, year, one year up, one year down. I, I'm not sure. I would argue that Hanjin is a game changer only if ships become scrapped because of it, because it's not, it's just taking a player out of the market. It's not taking the supply out of the market. And until that happens, it, it, it can also serve as a wake-up call. Um, that rates have to come up to allow lines to sustain themselves, and it's a wake-up call to make sure there's no new ordering for this current cycle. If all those pieces fall into place, sounds like a dry bulk panel. Um, you know, the, you know, then we're okay. But, <coughs> but otherwise, we're on the traditional, and it's the traditional two-year runway. And, and I would agree. In the long term, you're probably right. But you got to remember the last time the, the carriers actually got any kind of meaningful money was after the financial crisis and we had problems in the West Coast ports and there was a real uh, halt to, to trade and people woke up and, and that year the carriers got basically a thousand dollar increase. Right. It didn't last that long but it kind of brought the... But, but it's what we were saying before, it takes that or a war or something That's right. dramatic you know, dislocation <laughs> to get the rates up. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. But you reverted back talking about supply. I think uh, if, you talk, if you look at where demand could come from, I mean, there are in, in, in container ship uh, trade, there are three general areas, one where demand traditionally comes from, Europe, which is the longest, far, uh, the farthest away from Asia and provides the biggest demand in terms of ton miles, north-south trades, and intra-Asia. And Europe, Europe's demand has been mediocre, to put it mildly, over the last uh, period, and Really, one has to look at the prospects of the, of the Eurozone economies uh, recovering and putting their, their affairs in order. The north-south trades were affected by the low commodity prices because the countries that involved in creating demand have been affected by the low commodity prices. So there we had some weakness, and perhaps we need to wait to see commodity prices increasing for the economies of these countries to improve for demand for uh, for containerized uh, trade to materialize. And finally, in Tri Asia, which it has been below the uh, past rates of growth, but still pretty decent, I think, uh, is providing 3 to 4 percent growth even in the lackluster environment that we're in. So in terms of key areas to look, I would look at, at Europe to see when the Europe will put its affairs in order and sort of convert some more stability in development to uh, finished demand for consumer goods and uh, how the, the emerging economies uh, will develop economically to see demand in the north-south trades. And, and, that's a, and that's a good point, Tassos. And, and as, we, as we think about demand, I mean, surprisingly, you know, I think Shanghai and Hong Kong, uh, Singapore came out with port data for, for 
August. You know, volumes were flatter up. Year-to-date volumes are flatter up. You know, the demand has actually been you know, okay. Um, is really what we need to balance this market? Is it just more pain in this market so we see more scrapping? I mean, I don't get the sense from listening to any of you that we're going to see really, uh, you know, a pickup in demand really, really pull us out of the current down cycle where we're in container shipping. Is this just going to be sort of a war of attrition where the market's just out of balance until we come to a point where we need to see more vessels retired. I mean, Peter, you mentioned Hanjin, you know, these 60 vessels that are now, you know, what happens to these 60 vessels? Is it just, should, should we be thinking about, or at least our, how are, how, I guess, how are the panelists positioning their fleets or, or their strategies over the next six to 12 months? Um, is it just, you know, execute, generate a lot of cash flow, generate as much cash as you can and hunker down for a recovery? I think that's that's basically it. I think the but I wouldn't um, blame supply too much. Although the order book has been uh, it's high even uh, today with uh, the current market standards. But for 2016, the consensus, let's say, is that we expect a fleet growth of two and a, two to three percent. To put it on a, in a range format, demand traditionally has been way above that. Although lately it was very mediocre. Uh, I've seen forecasts of demand between 2 and 4% for, for, for 2016. So we are right around balance at a very low point, I guess, on the supply-demand uh, uh, curve. But we are right around balance, and if demand rever returns to the 4%, which is below the, way below the historical average, uh, still we would see the first step towards a better equilibrium. I think for next year, uh, supply demand, supply is expected to grow by about, again, 2%, per, two percent, if I'm not mistaken, 2 to, two two to 3%. Percent. So if demand continues with 3 4%, we'll see another year um, of improvement. So we are right there, simply, you know, both sides of the equation have to work in, in sync. Uh, there are segments within the overall container spectrum that have better supply demand um, Economics like the feeders have about 13% candidates for scrapping above 20 years of age and only 10% order book. So there you could actually see and we, are, we expect to see a decline of, of supply in 2016 and, 2000, and possibly 2017. But then again, you have to deal with some of the remaining or cascading, etc. So it's, you know, this uh, balancing is, um, is almost there and to, we need to see the whether, when we're going to turn the, the corner. This year, next year, early 2018. Great. And then just, I mean, I mean, I mean it, it's funny because I feel like, you know, when I started in shipping, you know, assets in the container shipping market were supposed to you know, last 30 plus years. Um, I guess I'm getting old. <laughs> um, as you think about, I mean, and all of you, uh, you know, have assets that, are on your balance sheets. Do, do we, is, is the new life cycle of a container ship 15 to 20 years? And as, as we think about depreciating an asset, you know, moving forward, is that how we should be thinking about it? Or is it still that, you know, 25 or 30 year depreciation window where you have an opportunity to make money for the vessel? I think, you know, I mean, we started at C-SPAN scrapping uh, sort of late 90s ships, 20 years. Um, in the 4,000 TU range. Uh, we, don't see, we see a longer life in the bigger ships. Um, again, again, there's no ordering now. We hope and continues to be no ordering. So I, I think it becomes actually more by segment of, of vessel. Um, but certainly in that sort of, you know, in this cascaded bracket, we've seen ships as young as 15 years be scrapped. So 20 years is probably... You know, if you're running calculations on any ship between, what, yours were 01, you scrapped? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So they were 15 and they were 3,500s, right? So I think if, if, if someone's running calculations on anything between three and 5,000 TEUs, they probably should be looking at 20 years. Okay. Great. Yeah, we're at an abnormal point in the market. I've got a very low rate for very long. Yeah. So this is re really an economic decision, not a technical one. Ships can last easily 30 years if, if they earn money. So if, if, if they earn almost nothing, 
then really you're going to hold on on them because of their option value in case the market recovers, right? Yeah. If, you, if you cannot afford to do that, then you have to scrap we, them. Or we, we've, we've retrofitted some of our 4,000s to suit charterers and had sort of 12-month extensions. Lowish rates, but again, way above the market, and those ships will keep, you know, will continue to be utilized. So as long as they're utilized by the charterers, comes, you know, we're coming full circle in discussion, you know, then I think we, uh, you know, we keep the ships. And then if I can interject another comment, there is also the old generations versus new generations. Right? The, the, the more modern ships are more fuel efficient and people are very sensitive to, to paying for fuel costs these days. So there is this big divide in a sense, you know, ships built in the 90s or even early 2000s are not as fuel efficient, that are out of favor. So it's harder to keep them around for their option value. And, and better intake and better design and stability yeah, as well. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're, we're under five minutes now. Are there, is there any questions from the audience? We have a question. Lambros Papa Economo from Lloyd's List. Uh, the last uh, three months we had uh, a near miss with HMM. Uh, we had a, a, the first ever bankruptcy of a major liner company. I want to ask the panel, uh, is there any other shoe about to drop uh, when it comes to major liner companies and also the container ship owners? I think uh, very generally, Lambra, all the companies are very stressed. I cannot speak so much about the liner companies, but most of the operators with the values having come down and with the revenue stream in case of those who had charters uh, being questioned for, because of the credit uh, quality of, the, of their contracts, I think every company is under, under pressure these days, and whoever has a, the lower break-even level uh, to survive at those rates and be the last man standing, as Peter mentioned, that would probably be uh, the one that would uh, reap the rewards afterwards. I, I think there's certainly greater counterparty risk. I think we're all more alert to counterparty risk. Certainly the rates going up, even though they're spot rates, have helped, as I said before, enormously and improve the bottom line for a number of companies, for all our counterparts and, and our ships, our clients are full, full right now. Uh, but I'm sure there are other shoes to drop. Yeah, let's, let's not name names here. Yeah, I, I, I don't think we're out of, the, uh, out of trouble here. Um, I'm certainly, I, I'm, I'm very glad. Uh, this whole thing, it's kind of funny, right before this announcement by Hanjin, uh, around two months before, we started getting a lot of um, requests from very major importers basically stating, What's gonna, what are you going to do if uh, one of your alliance partners' ship gets arrested? So this is on the radar of everybody. There's, we're not out of the woods yet here. Um, you know, I, I don't want to talk about what, what's going to happen with Hanjin, but it, it does not look very good right now. And there's other companies that are in financial distress. So... Uh, we're going to, you know, uh, in a way, I'm, I'm happy, you know, Costco now is going into a, an alliance where none of our alliance partners, there's, there's been any rumors or anything. Uh, everybody seems to be financially weathering the storms here. But uh, I think uh, we haven't seen the last of this. We have time for one more question. Great. And then just one more for me. Um, I mean, cl clearly there's been challenges at, at some of the major shipyards in, in Korea. As, as we think about, you know, the, their, the future of those yards, is, that a, is there any way that that is not a positive for the long-term outlook for container shipping? Double negative there, right? Well, I mean, if, if we see restructuring out of like DSMA or, I mean, is, I mean, it looks, I mean, it seems like some companies are talking about actually global shipyard capacity shrinking. Do you share that view or, or, or do we think that, you know, these yards may restructure and change their names, but that capacity will remain in place? I think there is some rationalization there too. I mean, the degree of which I cannot assess, but probably we'll have overall less sea building capacity given what the sea building industry has gone through, especially in China, I guess, more so than, uh, but Korea too. But uh, sea building capacity was always there when shipping needed it. So it's really, I think only lately China has been trying to promote uh, 
its, its capacity, but uh, historically, if you look back to the 80s, um, shipbuilding was always available, shipbuilding capacity was always available if ship owners wanted to build ships. It might have taken a little longer to build the ship, but uh, they were there, so it's... I think that's right. There'll be less capacity, but there will be enough capacity. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Howard. Thank you. Good to see you.